Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. You know, there was a time when we learned how to be a citizen through the process of what they call political socialization. It was through our parents, family, churches, social organizations like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, and of course schools. We learned the importance of citizenship to the functioning of a democracy. However, for more than a decade, the primary political socialization occurs in schools. Yet political knowledge continues to decline. Our society is more coarse and polarized. So what has happened to civics education today? Where well, joining me for a discussion is David Rando, who's the Director of Research at the National Association of Scholars and Executive Director of the Civics Alliance. And thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm delighted. Um, let, let's start before we get into some of the details. Let me just ask if you would um, tell us about the Civics Alliance and its mission. The Civics Alliance uh, was convened by the National Association of Scholars. It includes organizations and individuals across the nation, you know, such as the J James Martin Center in North Carolina, um, or the Center for the American Experiment in Minnesota. It is dedicated to reforming K-12 civics education, above all in the public schools. And what would you say are the qualities of civics education? Civics education should educate students to be able to preserve the American Republic, both by knowing its history, its ideals, how it functions, and basically why it is worth loving intelligently, critically, as a good citizen, but worth loving and preserving. Well, how would you characterize some of the civics education today? I don't know if it's political um, socialization as back when I was young, but how would you characterize it today? In other words, is there a need to focusing more on civics education? There is a very great need, and it's both because of long-term problems in civics education and a more recent and very negative turn in civics education. The long term dates back to perhaps the 1960s, where simply increasing lack of attention, um, less thought that it's worth spending any time, that it's not worth bothering with. So people simply began to forget a great deal of the basics of how the Republic works, you know, what our history uh, as a country is. What has replaced it increasingly in the last generation is something that, you know, the Civics Alliance is strongly opposed to. Um, it's a new civics, an action civics. It substitutes progressive activism, um, both, you know, the belief in progressive politics as somehow civic, and then the idea that, you know, action civics, you know, that work for a particular organization you know, outside of classroom hours for school credit and you know, overwhelmingly in practice for progressive causes is what civics education should be and that one doesn't need you know to learn about the federalist papers or how the bill of rights works this activism is as good or better for an act civics education well has the way with this kind of revision, replacement, lack of, the more perhaps some has used the word traditional, think of civics education. Um, has that contributed to the polarization that we see today? Yes. Um, it is used in effect to turn civics education into community organizing for, again, usually progressive causes and to regard any political belief that doesn't fall into this progressive category as uncivic. And if you regard your enemies, you know, if you regard your opponents on a political issue as uncivic, you know, enemies to everything basic in the country, you know, an enemy of democracy, this, this cannot be polarizing because you're regarding your, 
you know, of political opponents as basically un-American. Well, if we talk about civic engagement, and man, that's a term that passed around constantly and continually, but there can be civic engagement in terms of pro-life or um, uh, women's uh, reproductive rights. And so is there a distinction? In other words, civic engagement, it depends upon what the purpose of that engagement is. Is that what you're also uh, getting at? What is important here is how professional educators use these terms, and indeed virtually every term. There is an extraordinarily large vocabulary where the meaning of what are apparently common sense words have very different real meanings within the education profession. Civic engagement ought to include pro-life activities. I have never seen a single professional educator use civic engagement to refer to, you know, Second Amendment rights, immigration security, you know, pro-life. Um, so the way it is used by professional educators refers solely to a politically limited spectrum of activities. And when you are talking about education reform, this is why, in fact, we oppose the use of civic engagement because of the way it is used as a term of art within the education profession. You know, we have more access to information than ever before, um, and yet we know without questions, um, there's certainly less political knowledge um, among young adults today in terms of history and documents. And matter of fact, a lot of the late night comedy shows, you know, it's the person on the street. Who is the justice of the Supreme Court? Who is even your congressperson? And we laugh at that lack of political knowledge. It seems that the base of that is also just an, a, a knowledge element uh, as well. Yes, and in effect, part I, you need to know the history of America to know, you know what it is that's worth preserving and why it is worth preserving. So it's terribly important to have increased rigor uh, in content knowledge. Um, one thing which is terribly important is that the argument among education professionals for decreasing rigor is, there, there are two aspects. One, they think that rigorous education doesn't motivate students to learn. And two, they somehow think that it is quote unquote inequitable, that will somehow disadvantage you know, poor students um, you know, students with fewer resources uh, from, you know, doing as well if they're given increased content requirements. Now, this is a professional debate, but it's worth saying there is a lot of really good professional evidence that rigor inspires students to learn. You know, they love, they, they love facts rather than vague pablum. And, you know, and the facts are necessary for them to learn even further and to think on their own. And that also that rigor is actually the most equitable education, because when you get rid of rigor, in effect, rich advantage students learn the facts anyway from their parents and friends. Poor ones don't have that resource. Decreased rigor in the schools actually increases educational inequities. And th that's really worth emphasizing. You know, uh, in a recent uh, Pew Center uh, for Research, they reported that just 62% of millennials are proud to be an American, whereas 51% of Generation Z is proud to be an American. Well, if you're not really proud to be American, if you don't think that we are exceptional and that can be a matter of opinion, it's hard then, it seems to me, to talk some about the public um, uh, civics education. Is this a generational problem more so than anything else? It's very significantly generational. That is, you know, th there could be other things one could talk about, but the crucial thing is that each successive generation of teachers has been learning a more and more 
you know, skewed, limited version of American history and civics, in fact, a more negative caricature. And by the time you get two or three generations down into the cycle, you have you know generations of teachers now who've never themselves learned what's good about America to pass it on to their students. Well, we'll get to some content things in just a moment, but I'm curious because some would argue that you, is this a liberal conservative? Is it a Democrat Republican issue? Shouldn't necessarily be in terms of political socialization, but it, it seems to be, is it a left, right or Republican and Democratic issue? It shouldn't be. Right, right. There's going to be political, you know, valences to every um, educational argument. What's important right now, in effect, is that there is a deeply radical attempt to seize control of civics education, which has alarmed a bipartisan majority of Americans and teachers. I've been in touch with a significant number of, in effect, old school liberal teachers who are astonished, shocked, and dismayed at the changes coming into the civics curriculum. Um, and they think it's very bad for a liberal, old school liberal education as much as for a conservative one. And in effect, you know, and the aspiration to simply be a bipartisan American education. So I would say there is a political divide, but it's not between Republicans and Democrats. It's between the broad majority of Americans and a fairly small radical minority that unfortunately has seized much control of the education establishment. So um, would you give us some examples of content uh, of civics, what you would call civics curriculum? And let's start with the K through eight curriculum. What, give us some, some examples of what you think would be uh, essential in that regard. You need to start early talking about the nation. And this is important because this is an old progressive education idea that you start with the community, you build to the state, you then get to the nation very late if ever. And that means that when you're young, you don't learn the basic fact. You know, we are Americans. Here is what we share in common. You know, our flag, our anthem, you know, our common heroes, you know, George Washington, Susan B. Anthony, Martin Luther King. And you can teach those early on. There are a number of good social studies curricula standards that do this properly. Um, it's not difficult actually to teach a first grader in an age appropriate manner, you know, what lovely stuff about our country to you know, to begin the basis. So right at the beginning, you need to have civics education at the most elementary grades. What you need afterwards is there's actually three parts to it. You need dedicated instruction in Western civilization because that's the history of the ideals and the institutions of liberty which our founding fathers knew and built upon as they were creating our country. And unfortunately, Western civilization has been replaced by world history and I think every um, state in the nation by now. So you need Western civilization. You need a good American history course, which as part of its central core is you know, the constitutional history of the United States. You know, the founding, you know, the second founding of the Civil War, everything that's happened in the 20th century from the growth of the administrative state under the progressives in the 19 teens and 20s to the Civil Rights Revolution. Um, that and then a dedicated sequence on, we used to call it American government, um, and that would covers the territory. We, we're now calling it civics, but the point is, what are our liberties? How does the constitution work to preserve them? How do we as citizens work at the machinery of government at the federal, state, and local level? And that's not learning how to protest it, that's learning how to take part in it. 
where, and I guess I would say, and where a crucial part of that civics lesson is that we are self-reliant individuals, that the country works best when we work on our own as individuals or in civil society to solve our own problems without resort to government. Is there a relationship between morality, uh, values, other than just the content in terms of history or what have you? In other words, if back in the political socialization it was your parents, it was the church, it was the social organizations which reinforce certain values and belief attitudes and values, we don't get that necessarily today. I guess I'm asking, can you be a, a good citizen and not be a good person? Can you separate the two? Virtue is terribly important. And in the public schools in particular, there is a great duty to make sure that the call for virtue does not become special instruction in an individual denomination. In our own model social studies standards, American birthright, right, we phrase this as Republican virtue. There are the virtues of a citizen, and they certainly are related to the virtues you will learn in your, in your family, in your church, in your synagogue. But they are you know, related, they're not identical. We believe there should be instruction in Republican virtue in our civics classes, we're also aware that it's a delicate task to make that be something that's appropriate, you know, in a public school system. So we're in favor of teaching Republican virtue. We're aware it's a delicate line, but you know, it's a challenge which can be met by any good enthusiastic teacher. And I guess you would be quick to, to point out that again, it's, it's, it's a retort that we hear constantly. Well, but you won't tell the full history, whether it's about George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, or going like that, that you only tell, tell half of the story, and it's not the real story. And that seems to be a, a criticism that we hear continuously when you talk about civics education and certainly some of the actions that activist groups are, are taking, whether it's about statues or literature or what have you? I would say that the critique is largely attacking straw men. Uh, you know, there is no um, standard of so social studies education, civics education, you know, pushed by, you know, let us say, conservatives, um, which ignores the existence of slavery. They all mention it. Um, so it's attacking straw men. I guess I would say also any social studies course, any civics course is always going to make selections. You have to, there's limited numbers of minutes in the hour. You make decisions of importance. It is vital that you include the material about what makes our country you know, exceptional, a home of liberty, worth loving. Um, it's also vital that you include you know, how we have expanded our liberty, how we have gone from, you know, the common and alas sinful nature of humanity to living up to the promise of our ideals, that we have expanded the American prom promise of liberty, you know, with each generation. You can't acknowledge that without acknowledging there was a need to expand it. Um, so, you know, there has to be some critique, but when you embed the story of liberty and ideals with the story of, you know, human failure overcome, I think this is a reasonable um, combination of uh, priorities for a civics education. So, um, there's a little bit of controversy having to do in Virginia with Virginia social studies standards. I guess the governor uh, made some comments and I guess they're looking at what those uh, standards are. Um, what would you share on that? So I should say that I have begun to look myself at the Virginia social studies standards in particular just in the last few weeks. So this is a preliminary observation. 
it seemed as if there were a rather good series of standards in the previous edition. It seems that the current one becomes far more bureaucratic and difficult to read because they shoved in all of the pedagogical recommendations from what used to be optional curriculum frameworks into the standards themselves, that makes it difficult for teachers to even understand, and it makes it difficult for parents to have accountability over what uh, teachers are teaching their children. There then seems to be a significant political skew in the coverage towards what I would say is the normal radical caricature of America's history. You know, there is less coverage of all of the stuff to love about America, you know, far sketchier, and then very great detail in everything you would want to criticize about it, fitting a number of modern radical polemics. So it's, it's not, there are, I, I think the current version is not as bad, for example, as the draft Minnesota social studies standards, which I've also been looking at you know, recently, but it's a very significant worsening from the previous standards. And I think that Virginia would be well advised to seek a better model for its social studies standards. You know, uh, teachers, vast majority do come from institutions of higher education. Um, and I've spent, uh, you know, over 40 years in higher ed, uh, 32 as an administrator and certainly faculty member. Um, what has really transformed is actually the disciplines of, in terms of the state of the humanities and social sciences. And it seems that the college are producing a certain perspective that's going to be hard to overcome uh, as it relates to some of the civics education. So I, there's two things I'd like to say. The first is one thing that's terribly important is that a large number of the disciplines are now formally dedicating themselves to progressive political activism. The point of being you know, a gender studies major is to engage in radical activism. When you emerge from these disciplines and then become a teacher, you believe that the point of being a teacher is to be a radical activist, not to teach your students you know, whatever the subject is. Um, so it's terribly important that there's been that skew um, in higher education. Uh, I guess the second thing I would say is that there is therefore a need for reform of higher education to remove the roadblocks and requirements by which the educational elite is forcing students to you know, pay scarce tuition dollars uh, to be propagandized. Um, you know, the, we at the Civics Alliance have a whole series of model state legislation bills for how to reform higher education as well. Um, I, but I guess I would say that that is the most important thing to say. Higher education needs to be reformed. And I guess I would say specifically, the schools of education and the teacher licensure tracks also need to be reformed. Do you uh, think that it's important for state mandates in terms of a core curriculum that really focuses on civics? Is that where we should be moving to counter some of this? Sorry, do you mean at the higher education level or yes, at the K-12 level? Uh, well, uh, even, even in terms of like the State Council of Higher Education, certain um, minimum classes that you should take um, as a core requirement in higher ed? You need to reform the general education requirements. There are already at least nine states that require at least one course in United States history and or civics. You know, Virginia could very well join them and that would be wonderful. These courses can also be mistaught. It is important to try to specify that these are supposed to be surveys that are not politically skewed or restricted in their coverage. Even then you will have limits because of academic freedom issues. It is important, I would say, if you have a dual credit system or a dual enrollment system, 
to reform those so that those include you know, the general education requirements in you know, the social studies, the humanities, in American history and government. And the Virginia um, legislature and governor do have the power to govern the content of dual credit and dual enrollment courses. If you use that as a hook, you can make sure that the content of these core courses you know, can be learned by high school students and therefore they can get out of their college requirements. Well, you know, and, and uh, learn the essential stuff. Well, you know, um, we basically have run out of time. There's so much that we could be discussing on, uh, on that and um, in terms of civics education. And that is all the time we have. And I want to thank my special guest, David Randall, who's Director of Research at the National Association of Scholars and Executive Director of the Civics Alliance. And of course, I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.